You're listening to Dodge Movie Podcast. Your hosts are Christy and Mike Dodge, the founders of Dodge Media Productions. We produce films and podcasts, so this is a podcast about films. Join them as they share their passion for filmmaking. Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we're talking about the film Leap Year. You can find it on, you will have to spring for this one, $3.99 on either Apple, Amazon, YouTube, or there's a couple others, but those are the major ones. It was released in 2010. I don't really remember this movie. I feel like I should have because it stars Amy Adams, Adam Scott, John Lithgow, Matthew Good. I feel like I should remember this trailer and I absolutely do not. But no, I saw this uh, rental. I don't remember a trailer for it or it being in theaters. Yeah, it was released, though, in, like I said, 2010. We picked it because it's another Irish film set in Ireland. Beautiful, beautiful. Many little outside towns as well as in Dublin, like uh, Once Was, uh, meaning Once the movie. <laughs> A lot of the crew members were Irish, as far as notable crew members. It was written by Deborah Kaplan and Harry Elfont. So the synopsis goes, Anna Brady plans to travel to Dublin to propose marriage to her boyfriend, Jeremy, on Leap Day, because according to Irish tradition, a man who receives a proposal on Leap Day must accept it. Mike, what was our pickup line? Morning, gentlemen, is the first line of the film which maybe is indicative of the fact that there are two gentlemen that are interested in Amy Adams' character, Anna. Ah. Now, the cinematography of this film is just stunning. I mean, set a film in Ireland, it's almost like setting a film in Oregon. It's it's a slam dunk. It's going to be beautiful. And the images of the countryside, as well as, you know, the bustling Dublin at the end when she, spoiler makes it to Dublin. It's, it's, I mean, it's hard to go wrong, right? It really is. The greenery of the Irish countryside plays off well to the red hair and other red things in the film. So certainly you can see that color palette. I personally love that style of landscape, the countryside, the ocean, the skies are again, much like in Once, delightfully overcast for much of the film, giving a nice soft light to everything. So definitely cinematography is great. And they were aware that Amy Adams comes across really well on screen. And definitely took advantage of that and gave her some great lighting. Yeah, the one thing about this film, though, like you you mentioned, the overcast skies, it reminded me of a wet Western. In film school, we watched McCabe and Mrs. Miller, which is set in Washington. It's a Robert Altman film, and it rains almost throughout the whole film. And so, you know, a Western doesn't usually have rain because they're set in the desert. But similar to like when I watched Winter's Bone with Jennifer Lawrence, and just I felt cold while watching these films. And this film, she spends most of it in a pencil skirt and heels, which is highly impractical for the adventure that she goes on. Yeah, I think all of her clothing choices would indicate she had no intent of leaving the airplane until she got to the hotel. Right, right. But even even the little stumbles along the way, you know, once she spent the night in the first town, she put the pencil skirt back on. And I'm like, sister, throw on some wellies and a a pair of jeans, you know, some overalls, a good sweatshirt or a coat and hit that Irish landscape. But no pencil skirts in the middle of a a cow field. Well, I don't think she had planned on going through a cow field, but I will also mention, though, that for the back half of Act 2, she is wearing a pair of designer jeans. I noticed this because I don't think it's the most flattering outfit. I don't know what the costumer was thinking. But yeah, the pencil skirt with the high heels, definitely not good for trekking. Yes, skipping ahead to costuming. That's that's what I noticed. It does highlight, though, how a fish out of water she was through most of the film, which is was the intent of, I would say, the bulk of the writing of this film. So I would say early in the film, we see her in a sleeveless purple evening gown in which she looks gorgeous. And it did remind me of the outfit they put her in for the movie Arrival when she was at the kind of... Uh, Nobel Prize ceremony or whatever that was, there was a a fancy schmancy ceremony. And so you could see that where they were trying to show her going from that elegance to then now she's got a romancing the stone moment sliding down a muddy hill. Yes, I noted that it was very planes, trains and automobiles meets money pit meets romancing the stone meets it happened one night. There wasn't a lot of 
dare I say, new ideas in the writing. Well, I think you can see throughout the film, it was done in in kind of a broad way. And I don't mean that as an insult, but if you look at the sense of humor and the sensibility, there were the bit with everything falling over in her bed and breakfast room and the, some might say, stereotypical moment of her plugging something in and causing this sparking voltage and the loss of power. The bar fight had kind of this hillbilly music going with it. So there is definitely a sense of some broad comedy there, not really going for subtlety. Right, right. Was there anything else to the cinematography or writing that you noted? Well, I I mentioned before there is um, a lot of really good lighting on Amy Adams for her character. The one that I first kind of noticed where they're going out of their way was in the airplane where every other passenger has this cold, hard white light from above, which is normal in an aircraft. That's where the lights are. Yet somehow inexplicably, Amy Adams has this gorgeous golden lighting coming directly at her as if maybe there was a gaffer kneeling in the seat in front of her (laughs) holding a light. Um, They did a lot of the halo lighting, backlighting her with her gorgeous hair. They did some really nice dolly shots and some focus pulls. So definitely the camera department really brought a strong game to this film. Mm -hmm. So Adam Scott isn't featured prominently at the beginning and the end because he is kind of the Bellamy, of course, of sorts. So, Mike, would you help everyone understand what a Bellamy is? I got that term from Billy Murnett's book on rom-coms, and he talks about an actor, Ralph Bellamy, who played the guy that was a good guy, but that the gal never fell in love with. So there is this character like Bill Pullman in Sleepless in Seattle where there's nothing wrong with the guy. He's not evil. He doesn't grab her inappropriately. He doesn't steal from her. He's none of those things, but he's just not right for her. And so generally that character is played up as being very good, but very boring. And Adam Scott's character, there's nothing wrong with him. He's just not really in love with her. She's not in love with him. He has this very starched kind of approach, but very dry. There's no spark of chemistry. And Adam Scott does a very good job at that. Even though it's a small role, he doesn't have a lot of scenes. Yeah, I I definitely found, and I know you did too, and you're going to speak to it, that I wouldn't have minded if Adam Scott and Amy Adams' character got together. He he wasn't a dirtbag, but we're supposed to be rooting for Declan and Anna to get together, but it was a struggle for for you. There's the classic rom-com moments where when they first meet, they don't really care for each other. And as the film evolves, they have some shared adventures. Everything was really there, I think, in the writing. And I would say Amy Adams' performance, right? As I've mentioned before, rom-coms live and die on the female lead's ability to be both desirable romantically as well as approachable. And I think Amy Adams brings that in spades. Everybody wants to watch what she's doing on screen. She has some really good, appealing acting there. For me, I just didn't see the Declan character as doing the turn from not liking her, not caring for her, to having that spark. I didn't see that in the performance. And so this is a thing where I think back to what I heard Leonard Malton say that most movies are good. They're not great because it's very hard to be great, to get everything to align at once. And in this case, what I saw on screen I I didn't see that chemistry form between the two of them. In act one, totally, I think we're right on pace, but I never really got the sense that those characters' relationships uh, mutated, modified, got any better. In particular, their relationship didn't transform anyone. And I felt like that is kind of key to this, is to see that it's transformative to both characters. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a road movie, too, because she's on this track from, I can't remember where the plane lands. Some It was supposed to, it was headed. Somewhere in Wales. Yeah. Oh, that's right. The plane lands in Wales. And so she's got to get to Wales, from Wales to Dublin to get to Adam Scott. There's this timeline that she's got to get there by leap year. And there's all these obstacles that get in her way, missed trains, cows in the in the road. And it started to feel like, you know, the plagues from the Bible, all these obstacles that were impeding her from getting to her destination of Dublin. One of the first obstacles after the plane lands due to bad weather is she has to take a, a boat to try to get across from Wales to Ireland. What I find interesting is as part of 
the episode on once, I did some research. And at that time, it was like 20 pounds or something to get a ferry. It's a very common thing to go back and forth between <laughs> the, the two islands. And, and so instead, she's packed in this tiny little fishing boat, which again, much like planes, trains, and automobiles, is part of the humor. But there's a road element to it. You're right. Uh, there's a travel and so from a writing perspective, that's great because it allows them to put the two characters in tight quarters and it gives them these constraints that they have to operate. Oh, is the train going to be there on time? We have to rush to make this thing or now we can't go anywhere because of this other thing. So that was an opportunity, right, to put pressure on those two characters to force them to interact and to have a relationship develop, whether it's good or bad, right? It's possible that you could be forced to go on a road trip with someone and hate them. And so that sparks is what we would expect to then kindle a flame of romance between the two characters. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I started to see her character changing uh, near maybe like two thirds of the way in, like when she when she donned the mom jeans <laughs> <laughs> and um, she was starting to kind of I don't know if enjoy the trip, but but start to learn more about herself. But I didn't, like you said, I didn't see that in the the male character, so I was missing missing that. So I'm wondering if if kind of their chemistry is why we really didn't see more publicity with this film, right? And I believe that actor famously had some not great things to say about the film, and. That's possible that he came into it with a different idea of what the film would be. I would think from reading the script, it probably would have been fairly obvious how it was going to play out. But it's possible that uh, the different people involved as creatives had different approaches and it just didn't quite land. But I felt like that movie would have been very similar in her character arc if his character had been replaced with, say, a couple supporting characters. Because I, I, I felt that it landed like it was the journey that was transforming her, not her relationship with Declan. Yes, I would agree with that. This film also, I noted in the trailer, some pretty bad green screen, but maybe that's just <laughs> um, my warped 2020. This was now 11 years ago, so maybe green screens come a long way. And the pet peeve that I will probably bring up more than once in this podcast that I have talked about with my fellow filmmakers around, you know, in between takes, the empty coffee cup. And none of us crew members can figure out why Hollywood will not at least throw a little bit of water in those coffee cups because as good of actors as they are, they cannot mimic carrying a full coffee cup. And well, it just bugs me. I think one possible reason why they wouldn't put liquid in there is for spilling on wardrobe, but put some sand in there. It'll give it a little bit of heft that'll make the center of mass low enough. It'll look realistic because it'll move in the hand correctly. I feel like we can trust Amy with a little water, but I like your work around. I mean, at least put something in it because at the end of the film, she's carrying a drink container with two coffee cups. And all I could do was just look at how she's just flailing them around like they're basically two empty coffee cups in a container. Right. And so this is kind of an interesting thing that you encounter in writing is you'd say, well, who really cares about some of the details? But it all adds up together subconsciously to make something feel realistic. And that's part of the magic of acting, right, is the actors are able to give all of the subconscious cues, not just the words they say or how they say them, or even the broad expression on their face, but the small expressions, the body movements, the timing, the spacing, all those things convey many pieces of information that our brains process together into a whole that feels realistic or doesn't. And that's kind of the difficulty. And I agree with you. I think the coffee cup thing bumps us every time we see it, and it seems like it's an easy solution. Very easy, very easy. So did I miss anything? Other highlights? Trivia. I did not look up any trivia for this. Do you have any fun trivia about this one? Well, I, I had a couple of notes. One thing I noticed was at 22 minutes in, we get a shot of Amy Adams in her unmentionables, which is great for ratings and box office. So it is curious that we didn't see this film actually there. There is a Lucky Charms leprechaun drop in the film, which is probably standard for most Americans visiting Ireland, but I think we should avoid and hopefully I'll avoid that in our podcast about Irish films. It's going to be tough though, I know for you. And I thought it was interesting. There's a scene where they get caught in a hailstorm and the character of Anna laughs with glee. And the few times I've been outside and got hit by hail, it wasn't fun. I, I don't know that there is a such thing as a fun hailstorm, but maybe in Ireland they're more fun. 
Oregonian sighting, Caitlin Olson, probably most known to people for Always Sunny, is in this film as Libby. She has a couple scenes. Thank you for bringing that up because I have a new, uh, Northwest connection to every film that we talk about and I miss that. How about a smoochy time code? Was there a smoochy at any point? Smoochy, smoochy, smoochy. First smoochy is 56 minutes in. That's a long way to wait for a smooch with Amy Adams. Mm-hmm. How about hem- head trauma? I felt like there's something. Well, when she tumbles down the hill. Yeah. So the question we have uh, to initially talk about it, are drunken falls or romancing the stone slide falls down, slides down a hill qualify as head trauma? The answer is maybe not. But there is a shoe related head trauma at the wedding reception. Right. Right. Very good. Hour and nine minutes in, we get some $600 shoe head trauma. That's right. That was pretty funny. That was a good gag. Yeah. Also, a not for a metaphobes moment for Doug Benson is one hour and 11 minutes in, there is some vomiting. Oh, good call. Good call. So for the numbers, this movie was a universal spyglass film. So it had quite a bit more money behind it, 19 million. And it made 25 million domestically, worldwide 32. So not great for a studio film. It has a score of 6.5 on IMDb. It's about an hour and 40 minutes. It's rated PG, a romantic comedy. We did not pause this film once. I don't think that's ever happened. Probably not. I think what was going on is that it was a broad enough comedy that there wasn't a lot to talk about, even though we did talk maybe over the film about the cinematography because that was gorgeous. We did. How about a driving review, Mike? Do you have a driving review? Well, we saw a red Renault 4 as Declan's taxi cab, and I thought that was interesting that a French car, or a Weno, was in an Irish guy's garage. There's a lot of British cars that he could have had. Um, So he did fairly well, except eating a sandwich while driving is generally contraindicated, especially in a car with a manual transmission. And I'm not sure how the transmission works on that vehicle, But it seemed to be stationary on a slope and then suddenly was rolling down the slope. So maybe the system was a little bit off. I don't know. But as a general rule, they did okay. They were wearing seatbelts and generally facing the road. Good note. You just reminded me of one major personal foul that she violated in that scene. You take a man's sandwich and you throw it out the window. That's just not cool. That is really uncool because no one can really eat that sandwich now. No, no. I, I, I shrieked in horror when it happened. I think a better option would be to just eat it. At least make him share it with you. If you are wanting to once again in the month of March be in the Irish spirit, it's almost worth the $4 just to watch them drive through the countryside with these beautiful cobblestone walls guiding your way. I don't even know what those walls are for, but they're they're just there's something about them that are charming and beautiful. And they're in this little tiny car driving through the green countryside when they get to Dublin there's a great shot my husband taught me about leading lines and they are in the foreground and there is a row of tall buildings on either side of them creating this V effect so your eye is drawn to them and I thought that was a good use of leading lines in the cinematography of this film so I'd say it's worth the four bucks drop it and you know enjoy an hour and a half of Ireland All right, everybody, that is our talk about Leap Year. We hope that you enjoyed it if you watched it. And if you didn't, share in the comments. Tell us what you liked, what you didn't like. What other Amy Adams films you liked? Any future films you want us to talk about? Anything. Tell us what you think. That's Mike and Christy. Dodges never stop and neither do the movies. Thanks for listening to Dodge Movie Podcast with Christy and Mike Dodge of Dodge Media Productions. To find out more about this podcast and what we do, go to dodgemediaproductions.com. Subscribe, share, leave a comment, and tell us what we should watch next. Dodges never stop, and neither do the movies. <laughs> <laughs>